So I have the pleasure of introducing these two terrific speakers. Um, I'm Denise DeCoste, and I'm with the IRN, but I have the pleasure of introducing Christy Gabbard. Gab uh, say your name, last name for me. Gabbard. Gabbard. Christy Gabbard and John Mundorf. All right. So uh, let me introduce Christy first. Um, and their topic is UDL at the intersection of school improvement goals. And Christy has a, a master's degree in program development and outreach, and she's an outreach specialist at the PK Young Developmental Research School at the University of Florida in Gainesville. During her 16 years in education, she has taught elementary, middle, and high school students, specializing in reading intervention with adolescents. She's worked extensively with teachers and students serving as a literacy coach, focusing on curriculum development for schools and districts, and most recently, her work has been centered on supporting communities of educators as they engage in the examination and redesign of K-12 curriculum across disciplines. And now I'd like to in introduce John. John Mundorf is an award-winning national board certified seventh grade English language art teacher, again at PK Young Developmental Research School at the University of Florida. Um, Dr. Mundorf enjoys sharing his experience with others and has done so at conferences, workshops around the world. Um, he consults with schools, school districts, and universities and other organizations as well on topics such as inclusive teacher pedagogy, accessibility, technology integration, and practitioner research, school improvement, and of course, UDL. Um, he is a member of the Harvard Graduate School of Education's UDL Summer Institute faculty and the CAST UDL faculty cadre, and his doctorate is in curriculum and instruction from the University of Florida um, with a master's degree in curriculum instruction um, from Florida Gulf uh, Coast University and a, a bachelor's in elementary education from Bowling Street. Green, Bowling Green State <laughs> University. So that's, uh, that's a pretty long list of accolades there. So I want to introduce Christy and I want to introduce John and um, hand this mic over to them because you're going to have a really great session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, All welcome. Right. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, we want to just start off by thanking you for choosing to join our session. Uh, clearly, uh, there are lots of options available to you. And just the fact that you've chosen to spend some time with us today um, makes us feel really good. And we want to just thank you for coming in to spend the time with us. Um, Christy and I are really excited to come um, and share um, some of our work with you all, uh, work that centers um, around this idea of um, how do we get universal design for learning in all classrooms? How do we ensure that all schools and classrooms and school districts um, are designed to meet the needs of the students in those classrooms? And so. We're going to share some work with you. We come at this from different perspectives. Um, Christy works in a, a professional development role, in a pseudo-administrative role, um, whereas my um, position is teaching uh, seventh graders English language arts. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the work that's taking place um, in our environment at PK Young um, related to UDL implementation. Yeah. So before we get into that, though, Something that's important, I think, to understand moving forward is a little bit about our context. So um, universal design for learning um, is something that the context of that you all have a good understanding for. However, the notion of our school, the developmental research school at the University of Florida is a little bit unique. Um, so we're spending just a couple minutes to help um, you understand that a little bit better. Um, PK Young is the University of Florida's K through 12 public lab school. Um, the school has been in existence since the 1930s, um, and it is a public school. Uh, we have public school students, and they have to meet all the same standards that other public school students do in the state of Florida. Um, what, one of the unique components of our school is that our student body um, is selected by lottery, um, and it's selected to represent the state of Florida um, demographics in the categories of gender, race and ethnicity, family income, and academic ability. So for example, in the state of Florida, approximately 12% of students have IEPs, which means at PK Young, 12% of our students have IEPs. Um, it's a single school district. So we function not only as a fully operating school with elementary, middle, and high school, but also, um, even though geographically we're located within a public school district in Florida, we function as our own um, single school district. So uh, many, one of Christie's <laughs> many jobs is she lives in this space of not only a school-based um, resource pseudo-administrator, but then also as a district official as well. 
Um, and our school, um, we have really two missions. Um, one lives in this space of educating the students that we have, which is similar to everybody's mission. But then we have a secondary mission, which focuses on this notion of designing, testing, and disseminating um, innovations and best practices um, throughout the field of education. And we're happy to answer more questions about PK Young later on if you'd like to know more. It's a great place to be. Yeah. yeah so Thank you, John. And it's nice to hear John say that and I actually feel kind of proud because you've been with us now at PK since... Less than what? two years. Less than yeah. two years. And isn't that amazing? You did a really nice job talking about the work of PK. We have these tour tours that we have to give. And so there's <laughs> right. a script I have to memorize. Like, you got this. Yeah. It's going really All well. All Disney, right? Now. Right, Sorry. right. So um, our goal is to really share our story with you today. We have um, been on about a three-year kind of official journey to help teachers at PK Young um, and also across the state of Florida and, and nationally really think about responding to learner variability. And we were very intentional about um, starting our journey and our work with teachers in that place, um, talking about learner variability, thinking about learner variability, and not necessarily coming into the conversation um, with UDL or Universal Design for Learning as the upfront language that we were using. And so you'll kind of hear more about that later, but I want to make sure that I say that uh, first and foremost. And we were very intentional about um, the way that that story is or that goal is worded up there. Um, but now that you know our goal to share our story, we'd like for you to think about, I feel like this is echoing. Is it echoing a little bit? Yeah, I do. I feel like I'm hearing myself twice, which is like makes you a little crazy. There, I think that's better. <laughs> so why are you here? Uh, we'd like for you to just take a few minutes and think about everything that you've heard this morning. We've had some amazing speakers um, talk to us, give us some opportunities to network um, and think together. But in here, in this group, before we launch into our story, we'd like for you to think about why you're here and what brought you into this room today and what you're hoping to get out of the next 45 minutes or so with us. And you can feel free to do that individually or you can think about that with a partner that's sitting so nicely in straight rows <laughs> next to you. <laughs> so. Yeah, so go ahead. We're going to see you next week, too. I lost my phone. That's why I just have to leave the room. Oh, no worries. And I found it. So Good. I'm so sorry. I'm so you're rude fine. of me, so. Okay. Don't worry. All right, so we'll pull back together. So as we come back together here, clearly you all had a choice in the sessions that you chose to attend. And so this notion of UDL at the intersection of school improvement goals, um, anybody be willing to share a little bit about, as Christy mentioned before, this idea of why are, you're, why are you here? Why, why select this particular session? What is it about this topic that intrigues you or frustrates you? Um, kind of share some of the thinking about why folks are here. And, I'm, and I'm, it's, thank you for sharing that. 
part of this conversation will in include a little bit of our evolution in our thinking. You know, so what are the origins of this work, right? So one of the things that we all know, or at least at this point should know, is that you never want to have like agenda item number one is do UDL. Like we're just going to go do <laughs> UDL, right? There's a greater purpose for this work, right? And so one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit today is sort of the evolution of our thinking or the thinking of the, the school and the school leadership, um, including teachers, in incorporating UDL into the work that's taking place. Welcome, come on in. Come on in. There's still some room up here if you want to sit. But if you want to sit. There's some spots over here, some spots over there. Okay, this over to you. So I know that I don't need to give a lecture on effective professional learning, uh, but this is a quote that we go back to over and over again. Um, and we use this as an anchor in our conversations about just to re really remind ourselves that um, learning is going to take place when we uh, position people to think about their work, to engage in the work in the setting where they're working. Um, that what we're going to do today um, in this session, you're here, you're not back in your schools. Um, that's where the real nitty gritty is going to happen. That's where the learning is going to happen. So as much as possible, um, everything we're going to talk about is really about positioning uh, this conversation about learner variability, positioning the UDL framework, thinking about those principles and guidelines um, at the point where people are in their work in, um, and, how we've, and how we've been working on that for the last three years. One of the ways that we do that um, and I would venture to say probably the, the most important foundational pathway for professional learning at PK Young is through practitioner inquiry. Um, our teachers are positioned to engage in action research. Um, it's iterative, it happens in cycles, um, sometimes multiple cycles in a year, sometimes a cycle across multiple years. Um, so that can look different depending on how things are structured and the questions that are being asked. Um, but if you look at what we have up here, teachers play a central role in generating knowledge of practice by making their classrooms and schools sites for inquiry, connecting their work in schools to larger issues and taking a critical perspective on the theory and research of others. So in this work, um, we position teachers as professionals to engage in this practitioner <coughs> inquiry, and we've looked for ways to connect the principles, guidelines, and framework, the thinking that underpins UDL into where teachers are and where they're currently inquiring, rather than asking them to almost give up or let go of their passions, um, we've come alongside um, and asked them to think with us about where those passions, where that work connects into this UDL framework and how we can continue to go deeper now, perhaps even broadening what they may have been thinking about before and inquiring about. And I think I've said this multiple times, the practitioner inquiry movement f focuses on the concerns of teachers and engages teachers in the design, data collection, and interpretation of data around a question. Um, and we see teachers listed there a couple of times and I, I said just a moment ago, 
asking teachers to, um, or positioning teachers and supporting teachers to think about where they are, what's most upfront for them, what are the wonderings or the questions that they have, because that's where the expertise lie. They have um, questions that are real, that are meaningful, um, and we can support them in exploring those questions in a really systematic way over time and do that in a way that takes this UDL framework and makes that part of that exploration. Um, and in that way, we are really allowing this thinking and learning to go much deeper than it would go if we approached it from a um, let us tell you about UDL or let's make sure that we put UDL on a checklist. So when we think about practitioner inquiry, um, we'll use a lot of different terms meaning the same thing. Um, Christy mentioned action research, the idea of teacher inquiry, uh, practitioner research, whatever the, the phrase might be. It's this notion of um, beginning with a, a wondering, beginning with a, a felt tension within a, a practice, um, giving teachers and educators, so not just classroom teachers, but all educators, the opportunity to ask questions about these tensions and then look to find um, answers or to seek answers. And this notion of practitioner inquiry, really, even though it's not specifically about UDL, um, as we've reflected on this journey of incorporating UDL work into our environment, we recognize that a key piece of that is we have the structure established that allows for the professionals in the building to ask questions and seek answers to their questions. And so it's the cycle. Um, starts with a wondering, you know, based on some sort of a dilemma. Um, and so as part of our professional learning structure, at the beginning of the year, we convene a meeting, get everybody together, and we have a conversation around this. You know, what, what tensions are we feeling? And, and oftentimes, um, almost all the time, these are um, powerful questions that are shared by many people within a room. And then from there, um, once we've defined that wondering, moving into this idea of, well, okay, well, what question am I curious about? What, what knowledge exists about this topic out there? Um, what else do I need to know about this before I really dive in a little bit deeper? Um, and that combined with the question piece really puts teachers in this spot as we think about the, the UDL guidelines and we think about um, recruiting interest for teachers and sustaining effort and persistence and um, working towards self-regulation when we have educators creating their own pathway based off of things that they're curious about. Engagement stays at a very high level, especially when it lives in a place where they feel that tension. Um, so then, as, once we've gathered some information about it, um, what we uh, work to do in the school is to change something, you know, uh, change a variable. You know, if you want something to be different, you got to change a variable. So teachers are, are tweaking things about their practice and then collecting data about that. Um, and then at the end of it all, we get back together and we say, well, here's what, we, what happened, what occurred? You know, what do we think about this? And this all happens within structured professional learning space um, within um, the school year. So a few things about inquiry in action, what this looks like um, in our, our environment. Um, it is, um, and if you, you know, ask anyone that works at PK Young, it is the pathway for, for, for professional learning at PK Young. And just this itself, I mean, we could spend a whole day talking about what this looks like. So if you haven't already done so, writing or typing practitioner inquiry and circling it and putting a star <laughs> next to it, definitely going to be worth your Google um, at some point today just to gather a little bit more information. But this is really where it begins, this idea that we, we let the learner lead. Um, and in this case, the learner is the, the teacher in the building. Um, it's embedded into the work that we do. Um, and those of you that work on master schedules, um, you know how big of a deal this is. It's on the master schedule. So it's not on the, the second list on the whiteboard of let's hope we can get to it, um, but rather it's on the master schedule from the beginning of the year. Um, and although as a seventh grade English teacher, I'm not privy to those meetings where those schedules are put together, um, I would imagine that it's probably the first thing that's put on the schedule. When is this going to occur? Um, also, these cycles of inquiry, while oftentimes they begin as an individual question or an individual wondering, um, they oftentimes evolve into collaborative cycles of inquiry around shared 
um, problems of practice. So, um, for example, um, as a school, we're moving toward um, our, or we're, we are re-examining our grading system, um, looking at the idea of um, standards-based, competency-based, um, and one of the things that, over, and Christy will talk about this in a minute, is over the years, um, questions around those topics have grown and grown and grown and grown to the point now where we have groups of teachers working together um, on their own professional learning. Two other points. Um, we have the opportunity just because of where we're situated um, at the University of Florida. Um, we've had a, an added in professional learning opportunity for our teachers, where teachers at our school who are currently pursuing advanced degrees have an opportunity to take a uh, customized practitioner inquiry course through the University of Florida um, so that it will go along with the work that they're already doing towards that advanced degree. And um, then also um, at our school, because we all, in addition to being public school classroom teachers. We're also considered or classified faculty at the university. Um, we, are, we have opportunities for promotion within the university structure. And uh, a seventh grade teacher doesn't have a, many opportunities con to conduct large scale research, um, travel all around to do international conferences and publish on many different occasions in different uh, uh, places. However, within the promotion materials within our school, um, practitioner inquiry is identified as a key component in the way that teachers demonstrate the research work or their contributions to the research field. So I want to um, go back a slide and I think I guess the last three slides here. Context matters. So we've talked a little bit about this practitioner inquiry cycle, um, why it's important, um, how it's our pathway at at PK. And then the last three slides that John worked through gave you information about the larger context in which this exists, specific to inquiry, and how our teachers, um, educators really, every educator in whatever role, everywhere you look, you're getting the message that inquiry and this cycle of practitioner inquiry is what matters and it has value. And so looking across you know, stepping back from the giant, um, you know, play board and thinking about if this is important and if this is going to be our pathway, and this has happened over, um, you know, several, several years, even leading up to, you know, prior to this UDL conversation that we've been having for the last three years. Um, very intentional work to continue to step back from that and say, how are we making sure that at every place where we can kind of push a lever or move something that the educators in this building are getting the message that this practitioner inquiry is the foundation, it is the pathway, and it has value. So all of those different places that we're, we're looking to make sure it has value. And over time, as we've done that work, this is what's happened to our numbers of teacher inquirers. And we have a, a teaching faculty of about 73 teachers um, and then various other you know, support, 87 in total on faculty lines. Um, and these numbers are ab slightly above 60 um, formally engaged in inquiry, meaning they have done lit reviews, they've, they've written, they're collecting data, I'm getting data into my office off of those, um, those inquiry cycles and inquiry projects. So, we're well over 80% um, of, our, of our faculty continuously engaged in this, um, moving into next year, looking like we'll be there or, or even higher. And that's, you can see those numbers are not in that space. This is a really hard graph to read. I didn't make this graph. And, and it's one of those things where every time I look at it, I'm like, I have to remake this. And then I get to the next presentation, and I'm like, oh, I didn't remake that. Um, but you can kind of see, you know, it's there. Um, we have teachers engaged in inquiry, you know, over 10, 20 formally engaged in this inquiry process, but when we really got intentional about it, um, the numbers really started to move up. Just one other thing, too. When we look at this graph, one of the things that occurs for many or a thought that comes into the mind is just the, the question we all have is when does this happen, right? So, you know, uh, when Christy said lit review, so many faces, why are they doing lit reviews? Like, what is this? Like, is this because it's the University of Florida? And I think it's important to note that the reason why there's time and space to do this is this is our pathway for, for professional learning. So instead of spending hour after hour after hour throughout the school year sitting and getting in a whole group professional learning setup, we, we don't have that, 
right? Instead, it lives with and it begins with this uh, problem of practice and the inquiry question that the teacher designs around that problem of practice. And so we're not putting this on top of a traditional professional development schedule that you might see, but rather this is our professional right. development schedule. And then everything grows from this. So as we move forward, so what's, what's important for you all to know about this idea of UDL at the intersection is this is actually our wondering. Um, it's something that Christy and I have been digging into um, since we first met a few years back. Um, I actually wasn't working at PK Young at the time, um, but PK was doing this work around um, meeting the needs of all the learners in the school, what's that going to look like, and she'll tell you a little bit more about that background. Um, but ever since then, Christy and I have been having this conversation about UDL, right? Like, who, who's going to come out and disagree with UDL? Who's going who's gonna to be the person that says, well, you know what, it sounds great, but I really would, I'd prefer it if not all kids could right. do well in school. Not those kids. Right? <laughs> you, know, you know, ideally the perfect scenario would be some kids do well and others not do well, and that's probably the best that we're going to be able to do, right? So, so we all, and, and somebody said earlier today, the why is really clear. I think it was Eric that said, the why is really clear, why this is important matters. But then the, the how piece and as a teacher, um, a teacher professional developer, one of the things that I've learned over the years as a teacher is teachers oftentimes will say, well, how do you do it? Like, show me what to do, right? And so this how question for us has really moved us of like, okay, well, great, UDL sounds wonderful, but how? Like, how do we embed this into a structure? And for our environment, we're in a kindergarten through 12th grade structure. Um, you know, 1,150 students starting in kindergarten all the way up to graduating seniors, some of them doing post-secondary work. So we got the elementary, middle, high school piece all included in there. On top of that, our kids come from 32 different towns and communities in the area, so nothing about our school is a, is a neighborhood school. So how do we, where does UDL live within this? And so for a while it was UDL's over here and there's some other things. And what we want to think about right now is for you all, as you think about UDL, right, so UDL is a clear piece, what are those other things for you, right? As you think about all these initiatives that are out there. Yeah, let's use that word. Mm -hmm. I think that that's important. So think about initiatives mm -hmm. in the place where you work. And for me, it helps me to think about acronyms because <laughs> typically they have acronyms. So. Yeah, what's your alphabet soup look like? That's really what we're yeah. going for, yeah. right? So if you would, um, and this is an opportunity, if anybody feels like kind of standing a little bit, you can kind of go and meet somebody in a different row if you'd like to, but let's take a couple minutes um, and either individually with the person next to you, if you want to get up and introduce yourself to someone on the other side of the room, talk a little bit about, in addition to UDL, what other initiatives are out there for you? And then after about two minutes, we'll come back and we'll brainstorm a list of all these acronyms and probably have to explain some to others um, uh, and then move forward from there. But the real things, the things you're actually working on, not just the ones that you kind of know about. <laughs> ones that are on the chart, yeah. so it's going to be good. Do you want to pull this together? Yeah.
right, so take about another 30 seconds and finish up your conversations and we'll pull back together. I'm trying to get in the habit of an auditory and a visual signal. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's my new. I forget to establish that before. Beginning. Right, before we start, yeah, absolutely. And every time I've ever done that, it's just gold. <laughs> but, and all you have to do is say, hey everybody, when I put this up, it means stop. Right, That's exactly, exactly. But this is the only time that they're doing this, so. Right, exactly. I'm good at doing it with kids. It's like I see the small people and I never forget to do it, but it's adults that get me. All right, so let's go ahead and come back together. Yeah. All right, we got you guys started talking about uh, <laughs> your initiatives and you're in it, right? We were, just yeah. saying, we were just saying that we totally failed with establishing the quiet signal before we started. Right. And so then we're just lost of like hoping that maybe yeah, hoping this stop works. talking. Right? Yeah. 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 With, without being the, the adult yelling at other adults to stop talking. Right. right. right? Don't, don't yeah. be that person. I was saying to John, I always, there's something about seeing small children. I can remember to establish that norm at the beginning, but it never fails with adult professional learning that I somehow forget and then it's always in the middle. I'm like, this is what I'm gonna do when I want your attention, but it's too late at that point. So I was saying to John, I hear a lot of the same things that as we put ourselves to this same question, um, because this is actually what we forced ourselves to do. We sat with sticky notes and wrote them down and like put them on a desk. You're gonna see a picture of that in just a few minutes. Um, you guys are, are generating some of those same ideas. But let's, um, let's do a little bit of popcorning out. I won't call on you, but if you just want to popcorn some of the different things that you talked about, and when we feel like we have a good little pile, we'll, we'll close it out and, and, and talk about it. SEL. SEL. So and what we'll do, to, so do we want to kind of clarify? Yeah, when you say the acronym, kind of give us the words right behind it, because we'll all be like, what? <laughs> That's what she meant. Drop off prevention. That's a long one. I'm waiting for someone to say something that wasn't in our pile. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've heard it. Maybe this one right here. That wasn't in our pile. I'll give you that one. <laughs> we also talked a little bit about, like, um, it's, it's not an acronym, but, like, I have um, some departments at my, um, like, one of my high schools, they, we're all trained in Marzano strategy. And I sure. have a math department that's trained in study team strategy. Yeah. So those are also yeah. really critical yeah. pieces of learning for them. Yeah. And then putting all the teacher evaluation frameworks then on top yeah. of that as well. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Okay, that one did not make the pile. Yeah. Good, yeah, good. It's like someone that's working with me that in some way in my brain that's like a thing, right? So, yeah, yeah, and so you have this like entity that are, you know. Okay, so for us, this is what we did, right? We, we have this idea of, we know that we've been on this mission, as most schools are. We want to meet the needs of all of our learners. We talk about core instruction. We talk about Tier 1. We talk about making sure that the students are successful in Tier 1. That's the conversation. That's not a new conversation in the school. Um, and then we have UDL and this framework. And it's coming into a space where we've, we've, we're working on PBIS and PBL and competency-based ed and standards-based grading and, you know, da 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 da, -da all of these things. Um, and none of those things are bad and they're all very important and they're all in service of meeting the needs of all learners, right? That's why we're doing all of these different things. Um, but we knew going into it that if we put UDL in that conversation as universal design for learning um, and introduce that acronym into the language of the school, that we ran the risk of it becoming um, a thing on a list, 
Um, and so we were really, really cautious about Still that. Head nods for that. <laughs> yeah. The room shook there yeah. for a second with and everybody nodding. <laughs> once it makes the list, right, um, it's probably going to start getting the side eye. And then when you say it, you know, there's going to be that kind of thing that happens or it goes on the acronym bingo chart for the faculty meeting. <laughs> like we wanted to make sure that none of that, uh, this thing is really gooey. Okay, I'm just going to hold it. That'll be better. Do you want to? Is that okay? I'm oh, okay. Um, we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. So I think on the next slide you're going to see sure. some visuals of our work. Well, and then another piece of this, though, too, is as we, as you know, Christy talks about, you know, all these initiatives um, are in service of or moving us toward this idea of supporting students. Um, so one of the things that we started to look at was these inquiry questions, right? So as we think about moving a staff and moving educators in the same direction, a lot of it is finding common ground. What is that common ground? And so what we did was something like this, where we took everybody's inquiry question and we dropped it into Wordle to figure out what showed up. And this is what came out of it, right? So one of our colleagues, Ross, will be happy to know that he got a shout <laughs> right. out. He made the Wordle. Ross is really excited about that, right? <laughs> but so, yeah. so as you look at this, you know, clearly students learning is what is on the mind of the teacher researchers in our school. So as we're thinking about UDL, just like all those others, it moves folks towards this idea of improving learning experiences for students. But instead of saying, let's do UDL, or everybody get ready because UDL is the next acronym we're going to add onto your plate, let's instead frame this as we want to improve student learning with lowercase letters, like no proper nouns in it at all, <coughs> right? Just simply, we want to try to make learning better for students. And we mean that, like, I want, to, I want to talk about that because in this first part of the work, we were reaching out and John was the consultant and I was, you know, working on this project, a professional learning proposal project that we'll talk more about later. And we would literally go back and forth, like sending each other these documents and we're like scrubbing language out of the documents. Um, to keep the spirit and the intention there, but to make sure that in that first, you know, what's happening kind of thing, that they were not going to see the specific language around UDL. So we're like changing words, and I mean, it was it was actually probably the hardest part of that whole process was rewriting those things. It was intense. Like they brought me in, they said, "We you want we want you to teach our staff about UDL, but we don't want you to use any of the UDL words." <laughs> And it, when we send them to you, like, not only was it taking out, like, some of that UDL language, but also literally, like, taking capital letters and turning them into lowercase letters, right? And so instead of multiple means of engagement, it was all of a sudden lowercase letters, and it's focusing on engagement. And so, but what it did, and I don't even, I don't know if we've ever really even talked about this before, is that it forced the two of us, who at the time were strangers, we weren't even coworkers at this point, but it forced us to really talk really deeply about why we're doing this. Like, what is it? Why is it important to provide options for executive function? Why? Like, and, and really go beyond the phrase, right, into the greater purpose of it. Right. And so that began this right. then, which leads to this. Yeah, which is our pile of notes. Yeah, it forced us, to tag on to that, it really forced us to make sure we understood, like, what do we mean? Like, what are we actually trying to say? Um, which was probably healthy and good professional learning for both of us. Sure, well, it's, and it's for those of you West Wing fans in here, it's the next 10 words, right? <laughs> so, you know, that's, the first 10 words sound great. Everybody loves the first 10 words, but tell me the next 10 words, right? Because that's where it happens. It happens in the next 10 words. And so this conversation, it moved us really way beyond the next 10 words. I mean, we're full on dissertation at this point, but you get the idea. So these are just, you know, we... Everybody likes to see like the real, like, did you really do that? Did you really make a pile of sticky notes? Yes, we did. And so there they are, and then we have UDL, and so it looks like it's kind of in the pile, but at this point in the conversation, we're sitting at a table, and we've taken UDL and kind of like moved it up, saying, okay, but it's kind of sitting in the center. Like, how do we make all of these things flowing through UDL? And then you see really poor um, drawing here, but you've got students, teachers, um, curriculum, moving, we've all seen this triangle before, and then how do we position UDL, you see all the other little acronyms, and then moving around that inquiry piece, 
Um, and then down below, you see MTSS, RTI, PBS, MTSS with PBS and RTI as the support structure for the entire system. But we forced ourselves, and I think we're showing you this because as leaders, um, in, as educators in your schools, in your buildings, thinking about what does this mean for us, what does this mean for our work, and where do we see it positioned in our work is a really critical first step. And if you don't take the time to, to do that first step and force yourselves into that mode, it's likely that, um, not that we've done it all correctly, but we, we feel strongly that this was a critical piece. And if we were giving you advice, um, we would say, take the time to force yourselves into this space and think about where you are and what your context looks like and how this works and fits in your context. So you all this morning had the opportunity to hear from um, truly a pioneer in the field of UDL. David Davis um, spoke this morning about um, just the idea of designing. And prior to coming to PK, I had the opportunity to work with David as well as um, the terrific folks at the Problem Solving RTI Project, um, MTSS Project in the state of Florida. Um, and so David and I, along with another colleague, uh, Clark Gorman, we started having these conversations around where does UDL live within a tiered system of support? Um, and so through that work, um, something like this showed up, right? This idea of you know, having standards. And as I crafted this, Christy and is, were talking about it a little bit. And originally, I had a, an initiative that you all know about sitting right there. But the more we thought about this, this visual here is really this kind of became this model of the problems that we're having right now is that we all have these standards and we're trying to incorporate standards into classrooms. And then we have this filter of the initiative of the day that it has to like filter through. And then what ends up happening is then we try, treat these as these silos of, okay, well, I'm gonna apply academic standards through competency-based education into special education. Whew, that was exhausting. And I've just focused in this space. Or then I'm like, you know what, we're gonna really look at behavioral standards um, through the idea of cultural responsiveness and see how that affects our PBS work. Whew, that's exhausting. And this is how you get into this space of this overwhelming pile of post-it notes. And then when you show up and tell teachers, hey, I just went to this cool UDL conference, they stop listening to you, right? Because you threw another acronym and their acronym folder is full. They can't hear it anymore. And so it forced us again to back right. up. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is the, before, before you go to the blue, this before, is you didn't the, see that. Um, don't, you know, where we've been thinking and perhaps um, incorrectly about the way we approach our work. Now you can, now you can switch. Yeah, so um, John and I, I think somebody was in the room actually when we were still making a change to this middle. The first one we originally had universal design for learning written in that middle bar on the first slide. And we were like, but no, that really wasn't what was happening. It was insert, you know, project-based learning, insert, you know, standards-based grading or competency-based education or, you know, whatever, uh, student-centered uh, learning spaces. So, good slide, yeah. <laughs> this is our question. Can we position UDL at the intersection of this work? Can and if we position UDL right here, then do we finally get to a place where it helps us influence core instruction to the extent that it's in that design? And someone said earlier today, when you design well, you adapt less. So how do we take core instruction? On the first slide, it was a box, right? How do we take that and think about when we're talking about inclusivity and real inclusion, we want core instruction to really be responsive to learner variability. So it expands out. And the goals in special education and meeting the needs of um, kids who are gifted and talented and meeting you know, social emotional learning goals and supporting students who are learning English as a second language and positive behavior support and creating student-centered environments, all of those things happen as we position UDL and that framework and those guiding principles and continue to filter that design work through that UDL framework to influence core instruction. So this is our hope, like this is where we're going, that's our goal, that's what we're trying to accomplish at PK. 
and so much of this lives in this space of, sure, we can, we can retrofit after the fact, right? We can have an ineffective core, right? An ineffective instruction that everyone receives. And then we can scramble afterwards and do all kinds of interventions after the fact. But one of the things that we know from this work within Universal Design for Learning is if we do more work on the front end, there's less opportunity, uh, less need to do that. And I don't remember if this is a David Davis quote or not, but you know, oftentimes people will say the very best um, tier three intervention um, is a more effective <laughs> core right. uh, core instruction. Right? That's that's the best thing we can do. And and then the UDL piece came in here because before we had this whole idea of insert initiative here. The more we we would talk about this and draw this out and and think about where does it all begin? Like where does it need to start? Um, UDL just kept it kept coming up. But then this blue box around this here, really what it does is it takes away the silos and it creates more of a co-op, right? And so instead of okay, we're going to take UDL and then put it into this bucket over here. Instead, it's like, no, this is the core instruction. This is what we do. What is that going to look right. like? So what we'd like to do now, um, so this is kind of all of our wondering, our question, like what are we thinking about? So now what we're going to talk a little bit about is what we're actually doing with this, right? So where are the places um, in which we are incorporating um, conversations, additional conversations about UDL to build the capacity of not just teachers in the school, but everyone that works in the school, build the capacity of all the adults in the building to respond to the variability of learners. So let's go to that, that slide where it gives the list. Mm -hmm. I said earlier that context matters. All of the things in that list, ways of innovation, new teacher induction, collaborative inquiry, summer institutes, research and in action, take away on you yell, but just research and action. Those things existed in our context. They weren't new things. We didn't decide that UDL was going to be important and we were going to start thinking about how to implement UDL in our school and create six new things to do. Um, we stepped back and we looked at What's, what are we doing? What are our current ways of work? And then how do we think about that UDL framework at the intersection? How do we then run things through that mindset and that thinking? So I'll talk about each one of these. Ways of Innovation was actually the project that we um, hired John to consult, with, to consult with us on in its third, second or third iteration, probably third iteration. So we had had an ongoing um, project where teachers were uh, given the opportunity to basically respond to what's like an RFP, so like a, a proposal writing process, um, to do design work in their own curriculums and in their own learning spaces. So that was a, a professional learning piece that we had had in place. Um, teachers, the art, you know, the request for proposal would go out. Um, the teachers had a timeline just like we do to respond to that with guiding questions and we would do technical assistance. And um, so it's also structured as internal grant funding. So again, thinking about how to position teachers as the professionals that they are and respect them as the professionals that they are to take the lead in this instructional redesign. So over um, the course of now, this is the fifth year, um, there are some teachers in the back that have been responding to these um, calls for proposal for the last, you know, four or five years. Um, we have more than 80% of the secondary courses on campus um, that have been in this redesign process. So it's not a one-time process. It's a very iterative process. Um, but that's waves of innovation. So we looked at that. That was the project we were scrubbing that UDL language out um, in, its, in its kind of first iteration as we pulled UDL in and said, okay, we're going to make UDL part of this, but we're not going to say UDL. We're going to infuse these principles into the guiding questions as we're asking teachers to think about where they are now and what they're going to do in terms of redesign. Um, and now we're in the third year of that. So then as teachers have these questions or these spaces where they're thinking, oh, I see a problem of practice. I want to redesign this component of my course. What these um, RFPs or these, these proposals, they were structured to move educators through this lens of UDL as they're redesigning their courses. So as you look at this 80% of, more than 80% of PK Young secondary teachers have done this redesign, right? And they didn't say, oh, I'm going to do the redesign and it's going to make my class universally designed. That wasn't what this was. But the way that we had it structured was as they were redesigning, they were redesigning it with that systematic learner variability in mind. 
And so without realizing it, they were doing this work that they wanted to do anyway, right, to, to make their course more effective for student learning. We use that in the UDL framework, though, to guide that thinking. So then the next piece of this, <laughs> another existing structure that everybody has, is you have new teachers in the building, right? And new teachers in the building um, usually have some sort of a, an onboarding or induction process. And so this actually came about, we started talking about this, I think, midway through the year last year, yeah. of like, well, you know what? All the new teachers to, to our school, so um, if you're new to the profession, it's your first three years. Um, if you are new to the school, but you're an established teacher in another place, it's just for the one year. But there's time involved, time where there's professional learning space. And so new, te new teachers are overwhelmed with things to begin with. And so giving them all the acronym post-it notes really is quite possibly the worst thing to do for new teachers. And so we had this comment of, well, if UDL's at the intersection of initiatives, why don't we just spend time talking about UDL, right? And then through that, things will will be, make a little bit more sense. And so what we've started to do now this year um, is there's a monthly new teacher meeting um, in which we focus on um, professional learning um, to help increase capacity to respond to learner variability. And so within it, it's a UDL 101 class, right? You know, what is learner variability? What are the, the, the networks of the brain upon which UDL is built? Um, what do we know about role of technology within this? And so we use resources from the UDL IRN. Um, if you're not familiar with it, the Cedar Center at the University of Florida is another terrific resource to use. Um, also based out of Kansas, um, uh, AIR, um, I'm gonna leave somebody out here. Uh, but gr again, great resource. So there's a foundational understanding of UDL for every new person that comes into the building. And the previous version of that, so kind of insert UDL replaced, so the structure was there, the new teachers were going. The previous version of those monthly meetings was sort of like this indoctrination to every initiative that would be happening. Um, and so it was stuff. Um, and I'm not saying it was all bad. I mean, I it did it, so bad. I have it was, to, it was <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it, you know, and we would do these things like in the 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes that were there, like in that moment, Sure, like you're learning about X thing and talking about that, you know, at PK Young, we've had training on this and it's really important that you know about project-based learning and then, oh, and it's also really important that you know about these, you know, really important principles of assessment. And now it's really important that you know about this particular like writing, you know, or literacy program that we believe in. Oh, and you're new to the school and you want to know where the bathroom is and you don't know <laughs> where to check your mail and how do you respond to parents? And so all of that turned into new teachers coming out of those meetings more frazzled than they were before. Right. So then the other piece that we've added onto it this year is that all those new teachers are assigned a mentor, a mentor teacher. Um, mentor teachers also attend uh, this monthly meeting. We are all together for part of it, and then we divide up. And so then the mentor teachers go in are, and are receiving training related to coaching as it relates to universal design for learning. So as the mentee is working to incorporate UDL into their work, they have a professional learning partner alongside of them, coaching them along the way. And without realizing it, then those, those professional learning partners are learning about UDL as well too. Yeah, and the previous version of that was everybody had a mentor and every new teacher came to a meeting where they got initiative of the month training um, but their, men their mentor did not attend anything. It was sort of like you're assigned this person, this is your mentor. And so um, it's just stopping and thinking about, again, what is that structure that we have in place and what do we know? Like we do know these things. What do we know? And then how do we design this in a way that actually makes sense without adding to what people are, are being tasked with? All right. So... We have... We're on number three now. We're on number There's three. Five. This is actually, I, f I think John and I both feel really strongly about this one. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh, and then, what if? We might be getting to the top end of our, and then, so right now we need to stop. Probably not, though. <laughs> so, um, we have this collaborative inquiry. It's co-led with the University of Florida COE Partners in Educational Technology and in Teaching and Learning. Uh, we have six teacher leaders who are assigned to grade level learning communities in our school. Again, that's something that's already there. We didn't assign them because they were going to be part of this PLC. They exist as dual certified in special education, dual certified in 
content areas and they're positioned as embedded um, direct services to students um, at tier two and mostly tier three supporting tier two but then also as those embedded instructional coaches and we call them learning community leaders so those and they're they're very integral to our mtss system so those six teacher leaders along with two technology integration specialists four grad students and then the three additional faculty leaders, and that includes John and myself, and then um, another colleague, are part of this PLC. And we're working on a collaborative inquiry right now centered on how do we empower students to um, advantage tools and technologies in a way that lead to greater learning outcomes for them. And UDL is not in the question, but UDL is underpinning the work. So By design. And, and along with this, so this goes in this idea of how, how do we build capacity, right? So we're thinking about um, who are our new teachers, right? We're thinking about existing teachers that are redesigning their space. And then this one looks at who are some of those instructional leaders, who are the academic coaches, who's providing intervention. That's another group that needs to understand UDL. So in an existing structure, let's teach them a little bit about UDL. You want to take this one? Yeah, so this one we're real excited about, and this will be a shameless <laughs> plug thrown in here as well. Um, so an existing structure that was already at PK Young, um, given our mission to not only incorporate new ideas within the classrooms and study those ideas, we have a dissemination uh, piece of our goal as well, where we want to share what we've learned with others. And so existing already at PK Young was this structure to run summer programs, um, invite folks to come and work with us in the summer around topics that were intriguing to, to both parties. And they existed in different ways, but there was never really a UDL event. So the summer that I came on to staff, Christy said, would you like to do a UDL Summer Institute just for our teachers? So we invited 20 or so teachers, taught them a little bit about UDL, um, common language became a part of it. Well, then the next summer, so last year, we, same thing, we invited some teachers to come in, but then we opened it up to the outside. And originally, it was going to be capped at about 20 people. And then Christy came to me and said, John, um, we are already at 20 people. Can we bump it up to 25 people? And I said, sure. And then by the end of the day, she said, we're going to need to bump it up to 35. And then by the end of the <laughs> next day, she came in and she said, how does 45 people sound? And I said, that's good. That's probably enough. And she said, OK. And then we ended up with 62 people um, who <laughs> came in the I summer. I can't say no. Who so came in the summer. That. We had two. Uh, uh, vans of educators from Texas who drove over um, there the principal brought his middle school team to learn about UDL and so it was a terrific success um, in so many ways because not only did we have folks coming in from the outside so we could share really good thoughts with them but our own teachers were there too and so then those teachers then continue to grow in their capacity to incorporate UDL. Well, this year, the demand is so high, we've actually opened up a second institute. So we're gonna have an institute that's more of a get to know UDL sort of an institute, and then we're gonna have a digging deeper institute as well. Um, now, don't get nervous and don't all jump online at once, but Christy just told me there's only like four or five spots left available in one of them, um, which probably means there's like 30 more spots available, uh, <laughs> given our history together. I have to, you know, I know how to do this. So um, I wanna say, exciting and we're excited about that and we love to you know tell the story of the institutes at pk and invite you to come but what's i think important as a takeaway is you're thinking about your work back in your own context and i've been doing these institutes for i don't know 10 years now and we've had institutes where it's just folks from the outside and we've had institutes where it's just pk folks um, and I think I've maybe finally learned this lesson that making that blend is really critical. It's really important to the learning um, for both to have a mixed audience. I've had institutes before where a, a single school or a single district has taken the entire institute of maybe 35 seats. And it's not that they're not wonderful, but that doesn't work as well either. So making sure that when those, you know, things are coming together if you're thinking about structuring this kind of opportunity how can you make sure that that group of people is diverse um, as they're coming in and experiencing that together and getting that group to be really heterogeneous is really critical um, so and, a, and a, just a quote about we had one of our teachers at the school who's come to a couple of the my udl uh, workshops um, was sitting next to that very principal from um, from texas that brought in his whole team 
And afterwards, I asked him how his day was going, our, my colleague. And he came up and he said, you know, John, I've heard you talk about UDL a whole lot. But I'll tell you what, after talking with Justin, it just makes a whole lot more sense right now, right? <laughs> so that's the other part of it, the whole idea of, you know, you're not really an expert on your home turf, right? And so bringing in folks from the outside help to add a little bit of perspective that so often in professional learning we don't have, right? I mean, think about the professional learning that takes place within your schools or school district. Is it usually people that all work there? Right? How often do we invite people from other spaces to provide some contrast? And I'm going to get, I want to just get real for a minute too about this structure because I think it's important. I think it's something that people can replicate. And often I hear, well, that's PK Young and we can't necessarily replicate that. Or how do you have funding to do an institute, you know, with budgets and constraints? Um, so the way that it's like cunning plan, um, I structure it so that for every two outside participants that I have coming into this institute, I can fund an internal faculty member. And that's how I structure it. And I make sure that I keep my, you know, I keep running the numbers and keep, you know, can I get five more over here? That means I can get two and a half more over here. And like, you know, I, that's, we run, we're public school and we have public school funding structures. And so I don't have a budget or money to pay teachers um, their summer salary rate to come in for a week or two weeks. So I do have to, you know, we have to be creative about how we do that. Um, I think it's so valuable, that intense experience to then lead into the year as we're talking about practitioner inquiry, as we're talking about these things that are occurring while you're, someone used the slide, was it you this morning with an airplane? Mm -hmm. And you're, yeah, so if you can get some knowledge and skill at building airplanes before it starts, before you have to start building while you're flying, that's better. So <laughs> that's... And this is one of the ways that we continue to connect and, and not only work with our own faculty during the year, but also um, connect them with others um, and position them to talk about their work. And I can't say enough about the importance of providing a platform, um, a real platform and stepping back and allowing the teachers to talk about their inquiry, their dilemmas, their work, their development um, in real ways as it's happening in their classroom and how valuable that is for the professional learning of the teachers on our campus. So often when we think about research and action, we think about the professional learning that the teachers that are attending research and action are getting by being in our classrooms and observing and talking with our teachers. And so as the person that is structuring professional learning inside the district, um, I love that because I want to reach out and connect with and have outreach and help others. But this is a structure for professional learning for the teachers that are working at PK because as they are talking about and teaching others and working with others on their work, that is the, probably the most valuable form of professional learning that they could be in. And the collaborative component of this is that none of us are, are perfect at this. We're all learning about this together. And so when we structure these, whether it be a summer institute or a research, research in action, we structure it as come learn with us. You know, we're learning about it. You're trying to learn about it. We're gonna be better if we learn about it together. And so let's come in, we'll invite you into our space, we'll have teachers that will open up their doors that will say, come in and give me some feedback. What do you notice? What do you see? And because nothing about this lives in a punitive space, um, teachers are willing um, to say, come on in, what do you think? How does this work? And so when we set these up, it's never as, oh, come and see my classroom. It's a perfect UDL space, but rather, I'm trying really hard to make sure my classroom works for all my students. What do you think? What do you think about it? So we, as we're going on and on, there's other things that are occurring right now too. And these are gonna probably end up being topics for the next talk that we have when we come back next year to talk about where we are now. Um, this conversation actually started this past summer. Um, we spoke at the CAST symposium that was at the Harvard Law School. And we shared kind of the beginning of this because we were, this is where we are. And so now we're at the spot where we have, we have five pieces moving forward. But what's starting to happen are as we think about how these five efforts, how it's changing systems, right? And so without really meaning to, our teacher evaluation system is starting to morph a little bit, to be more teacher directed. Teacher, what do you want to work on? How, how are we going to craft your professional learning plan? Within a tiered system of support, you know, how does this impact the interventions that we're able to provide? How does this impact our core instruction, our, our data-driven uh, instruction, um, how we're using data to make decisions about instructional choices and design choices? And then also, um, this notion of, as we continue to actually teach the kids at school, right? how does all of this thinking, these conversations, impact 
the programs that we're incorporating, the, the curricular opportunities that are in place? So I think the multi-tiered systems of support, I mean, that is really the system. Right. John and I were talking about this slide earlier and we like debated like what's even on here. <laughs> so like, okay, teacher evaluation, I'll give that a bullet because it's like a thing and there are resources and it's, you know, legislated and there's a lot of stuff that goes along with that. So it can have a bullet. But I want to I want to say multi-tiered system of support and how this intersection, what that looks like and how it influences the way that core gets talked about when and in, in multi-tiered system of support, I would say that most most structures, you know, everybody has different ways of doing that, but most structures have some version of stakeholders coming together and talking about um, the way that students are responding to instruction and the way that we're responding to student needs. And the way that the conversation has been able to shift um, more and more into core, which is where it needed to be all along, um, has been amazing in the last two years. And so that's something that as we've seen that grow, we've tried to, okay, how do we water it? How do we fertilize it? How do we, you know, how do we make sure that, that this is something that continues to come out of that conversation? So we have a little bit of time left. Um, we wanted to put this up here um, as an invitation to you all. Um, clearly, in an hour long session, um, many of you are probably walking out with more questions than you had when you walked in. Um, Christy and I position ourselves as, um, as two educators who are trying to do good by kids, and we want to network and interact with other people who feel the same way. And we hope more than anything that this isn't the only time that we get to talk with you all about this. Um, we want to continue those conversations. It's really interesting. As I'm sitting here, I'm looking around the room, and I see so many different folks that have come to visit and spend time with us at PK Young already. Um, and so it's really neat because it's what we always say. We want to continue these conversations. Um, so if you want to come visit, let us know. Um, if you want to um, take a look at one of the institutes, that's, that'd be great. If you just have a question or you want to know more about this, that, or the other, fine. Um, if you just are mad because I haven't put the slides up on the sketch yet and you want to email me that, you can do that too, right? Yeah, so what, I mean, really whatever works best. Um, but we were really, and I hope it comes through, we're, we're really excited about what's happening and we're really passionate about this not because it gives us a chance to talk at a conference here, but because we have kids um, that are doing better in school. Um, one of the things about our school is that kids come from all over the place, right? We have kids that are coming in from the hog farm in the far corner of the county, right? We have the kids whose parents are literally rocket scientists at the University of Florida, right? We have the kids that are living in government subsidized housing, right? And, and they're all coming to our school, our wonderful little place where we get 1,150 students and we get to not only um, teach them these great academic standards, but we also, we hope, provide a space um, where they can get to know a little bit about each other and a little bit more about the world around them. Um, so what we'd like to do is just for this last little bit of time, um, we threw a whole lot at you. That was a whole lot of us talking and you sitting there listening to us. It's because of these chairs. Yeah, sorry. They sent me yeah. an email and told me that yeah. it was yeah. talking to you only. <laughs> chairs facing forward. <laughs> Scrap the original plan, <laughs> right? Um, any questions or comments or um, any tension that you're feeling? You may want to argue. Okay. I'd be happy to. Yep. Yes. Hi, remote viewers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering about the crafting mm -hmm. of the inquiry with individual teachers. Mm -hmm. How do you help them get that just right size of the question? That's a terrific. So the question yeah. was, as it relates to crafting the inquiry question, what supports do we provide for teachers to get them to the spot where they have that just mm -hmm. right question? So. Um, as John said, this is you know part of our structure. So we have time dedicated on our you know embedded like we have embedded professional learning on Wednesdays, um, and so in the beginning of the year, as we're thinking about our wonderings, we actually structure protocols where um, the I have my kind of wondering draft out. It's usually really really rough, um, and then we're like I sit with a map of the entire faculty and structure groupings. So that when you come into that space, you know I'm going to be with my wondering and I have these three people that are going to be helping me tune my question and my wondering. And we use a tuning protocol to do that um, and really work through it. And then in those groupings, I'm just very intentional about who's in the grouping 
and, and who's going to be able to support. Um, and then we have resources that we use. Um, the Reflective Educator's Guide to Practitioner Research is one um, that we can, I'm happy to you know, make contact and kind of send you the list of like, these are the resources that we use. These work really well. We break them down into shorter protocols that can work within about 45 minutes or an hour. Um, but yeah, and, that's how and, we do that. And then also in any um, school structure you have um, teachers with different levels of experience related to various topics. So as it relates to practitioner inquiry, um, we have a core group of teachers in the building who have been who have been at this for a while, right? And so um, many times those teachers will serve as another filter, mm -hmm. right? Um, to look at a question and maybe provide a little bit of teacher intervention, right? You know, somebody, a teacher might ask a question that's really broad and there's no way they're ever going to be able to dig into that question in the space that we have provided. And so, again, we have structures in place to be able um, to, to tune that to where it's, it's doable. Because one of the things that we've learned is that if a teacher's question isn't in a good spot, it really, it really has a negative impact on the rest of the process for them. Sure. So there were a uh, question in there was a question around um, the, um, I'm sorry, I lost the first one. The second one was about coaching. Yeah, so coaching models and then as, uh, as well as the observations. Gotcha. Questions like what do we use for coaching? What's our coaching model? And then what do observations look like? What do those spaces look like? Yeah. So um, our, our coaching and our observations are kind of all wrapped up together. So um, every faculty member is connected to um, Another school leader, I will say, because it's not always a traditional like administrator. So I do that work with 21 faculty members. Um, I, you know, the principal does that work with around 20 assistant principal. Um, and so then we're partnered throughout the year. Those are those are the faculty that I'm meeting with, that I'm working with, um, that I'm doing coaching with, and also um, as observations make sense and are occurring out of that cycle, I'm doing those observations. Um, so that's the way that that exists. We don't have um, sort of a, a system where the administrators are coming in and doing a, a more kind of traditional, I'm going to observe in a classroom. We've broadened that idea of what does observation mean. Um, and when we're observing teachers' practice, what are the areas of practice? So, um, you know, with many, many of the 21 teachers that I work with, I, I mean, I've observed John teach because I've been in his room to talk to him about something else or, you know, whatever, and I'm sitting there watching him teach, but in, I'm his partner, mm -hmm. and in his cycle, I'm not observing him in his, while he's standing in front of kids necessarily, but I'm engaging with him as he's planning, and so I observe that. I see it. I, I see the student work that's coming out of it. I see the decision making that he's is doing as part of that, and so that's all kind of wrapped together. And then also, too, it's important to note, too, that as a Florida public school, we're, we're required by the state to, to meet all the state's requirements as it relates to teacher evaluation. And so this model that we've put together meets all of those requirements, too. So a lot of times when we're interacting, especially with folks here in Florida, who will say, well, we can't do that because we have to follow the state guidelines on teacher observations and, and evaluation. Mm -hmm. Well, so do we. We're just, we've just chosen to go this other right. route with it. That's, that's, that's our instructional mm -hmm. practice. Yeah portion of the evaluation comes through that model. Well, thank you all for coming in. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy the rest of your time at the conference.